So the Delhi G20 has been a success, a resounding one at that by every yardstick that is imaginable. And one of the chief architects behind that success is now joining me, External Affairs Minister Dr. Jay Shankar. Thank you very much. And many congratulations to you and your team well, thank you very for what has been hard work over the last one year plus. What does it feel like, like, like uh, scoring a Test Match 100? Uh, well, I don't know about that, but uh, I, you know, uh, I, I think at one level, yes, uh, there is a lot of satisfaction that what was a, a very high profile, very complex uh, event logistically yeah. uh, was pulled off. But uh, I think more than that, it is also that uh, at a very difficult time in the global um, political environment, uh, we were able to actually get uh, 20, the 20 most important countries to actually uh, reach a consensus on a crucial set of issues, which is very important, uh, which is very important to set the directions of where the world's going to be going for the rest of the decade. So, all the focus, of course, has been on the joint declaration. And 12 hours before the declaration was officially adopted, negotiators were still not sure whether they would arrive at it. So give us what was the inside story. How did it, how did it actually come through? Well, I, I don't know about 12 hours. I can tell you it was much closer than that. Much closer than 12 yeah. hours. I mean, uh, let, me, let me be roll back here a bit. Uh, you know, it was not that we thought a declaration wouldn't come out. Okay. But because I think, you know, somewhere all of us certainly, uh, you know, the team we had, Sherpa, myself, uh, uh, and we kept PM, I kept PM apprised from time to time what was happening. Uh, we had a sense eventually that we'll get there. But ha having said that, you have to get there. Yes. And uh, what would happen is, you know, it's like, oh, we have it nailed down and then something else would happen and then we'd say, no, somebody is bracketed. Some. So it was never done till it's done and that kept coming closer and closer and closer. Uh, so much so that uh, even uh, on the in the forenoon of that day, mm -hmm. uh, on Saturday ninth, morning, 9th yeah. uh, September, uh, while session one was going on, uh, we still had some issues to be nailed down. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so uh, this was obviously uh, at you could say at one level uh, uh, a source of uh, concern or tension or whatever it is, but. Again, for look for those of us who have done a lot of these things before, uh, this is uh, how uh, big international events go, that it really goes down to the wire and you've got to hold your nerve, uh, you've got to make that last uh, push. Uh, and uh, uh, which is what we were doing even uh, as people were arriving, even as uh, between session one and session two we took a break, yeah. uh, even then we were still kind of... Uh, uh, Not over the line. Well, we were uh, get trying to get everybody uh, into confirming that they were comfortable with it. In some cases, there were holds, uh, you know, on certain issues. So, uh, so it was a kind of a live action. Uh, almost you know, like a cricket match. Yes, uh, till, till, till the very end. So, you did mention in the press conference as well, the emerging block of countries, which is Indonesia, Brazil, South Africa, along with India, played a role in helping narrow down differences and finding a, a text that's acceptable to all. Can you elaborate on that role and what may that mean, the coming together of this emerging bloc? Well, uh, you know, there's some history to it. Uh, the history to it was that last year, uh, Indonesia was the chair, the summit was in Bali. Uh, and uh, the, the kind of pressures that we felt this time, Indonesia felt last time. Uh, and uh, 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 what we all did, uh, at least, and I can say this particularly for ourselves, uh, was that we, we really kind of batted for Indonesia very, very strongly. I remember last year even going uh, to Moscow to meet the Russians to, to, to discuss this. Uh, now, uh, this time around, I think that feeling uh, was strong among a certain uh, group of countries and I think particularly the four back-to-back uh, -back chairs, Indonesia, us, Brazil, South Africa. Uh, but a few others as well sure. that look, we all need to uh, come, together. Uh, come together and uh, persuade uh, the others to, to find a, a, a reasonable uh, a middle ground. Uh, so uh, at one level, 
this 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 kind of diplomacy uh, was going on but uh, bear in mind that you know finally uh, it isn't just a textual fix i mean there were uh, real political positions uh, at stake here so uh, some of it therefore also depended very much on uh, how did the countries uh, feel about india so the more we were able i mean uh, if i were to uh, broadly let us say classify them into three groups those countries who were actively working with us yes so we had to enthuse them to to work with us those countries who were who had strong entrenched positions so we had to make them understand that look we respect your position but surely uh, you know uh, it's important for you that the indian presidency uh, as as success, succeeds yeah. and therefore to some extent it was influenced by the nature of their relationship uh, with india and then there were some who uh, you know whose good wishes were with us but who are waiting for things to move now to uh, some extent this is really where pm came in uh, very strongly which was you know uh, by going to indonesia i mean which the indonesians appreciated enormously okay. that you know for someone who's you know for where the visitors are arriving on the 8th yeah. to be in indonesia on the 7th yeah. and just to go there just to do that i i think it 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 not only uh, sort of uh, enthused uh, motivated indonesia very strongly i think it sent a very strong message to the others as well that look here, here are all of us standing uh, standing by each other and working together it also gave him an opportunity to talk to some of the others some of the others he spoke there some of the others he spoke here uh, and uh, you know in certain specific cases uh, you know based on the feedback from the sherpa team uh, i actually went to pm and said you know sir could you please have a word with you know country x or country y uh, and uh, which it uh, so uh, so that's really i mean that last i would say 12 hours 10, 12 to 24 hours but especially on the 9th itself Uh, uh a lot of that uh, happened you know by his uh, also intervening with the absolutely crucial people because there were one or two um, holdouts yeah so tell us about this because there has been some criticism ukraine has said this on record that uh, they believe that the language on the russia ukraine war has been uh, diluted that russia has not been named directly how would you respond to that please see uh, it's like this uh, the Uh, as you know the conflict started last february uh, we've already had one g20 meeting yeah. the g20 took a collective position uh, out there now the point is uh, we also all have to uh, assess uh, whether the purpose of a g20 uh, gathering is to uh, reiterate a position and uh, uh uh sort of uh, uh, make that like a uh, you know some kind of immutable concept from which there should be no divergence or whether we should update that issue and bring in further developments and uh, also uh, uh, capture those as part of the concerns so you know uh, you could say for example there's a 100 uh, billion dollar commitment which was made in paris Yes. Uh, on climate change so you could argue well every uh, position therefore should only rate rate what it is and we should not be discussing anything else but we don't do that we we keep evolving the climate action uh, argue, you know position as we go along so in the year that has passed uh, the uh, the fact is that the uh, gray black sea grain corridor has become a source of concern it's non functioning the attacks on the infrastructure are a source of concern uh the fact that uh, there is a discussion going on in groups of countries in the world is also a development which needs to be noted but most of all uh the i mean the central uh, concern uh, which needed to be captured was the impact of all of this on the rest of the world the global now, south now if you are now you are trying to let's say we have this as a position now you want to also carry this 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 and this i mean in in any kind of international negotiation that core is not 
going to remain exactly what it was, then they will say fine, then go with that and yeah. let's not get anything else in. So, uh, I, my, my own senses, I, I, uh, I would say uh, very uh, respectfully to all, uh, all parties who may have concerns of the kind that you have expressed that, look, uh, this is a, uh, this is a uh, evolving issue. It cannot be that on the one hand you say, oh, by the way, the entire world is concerned about it, but I will not express that concern in a statement. So the concern will only be a, a very narrow concern which will be a cut and paste from a previous year. So if it is a truly global happening, which is why we are discussing it in the G20. Correct. Okay. Uh, then, then the totality of that should be captured. No? Sure. So the other big announcement that happened on the sidelines of the G20 was this corridor between India, the Middle East, going all the way to Western Europe. Uh, many are saying this is in response to China's Belt and Road. Uh, I know you will say that it stands on its own merit, but we have not seen, at least in scale, something to match what China has been doing for the last 10 years with One Belt, One Road. So to that extent, to the scale extent at least, is this something that matches no, up to look, it? Look, I, I think the moment you get into comparisons, you are going down a fundamentally wrong road. Okay? Uh, what is this about? This is about uh, you have a very important economic center, historically, in, in human history, uh, which today is once again regaining its place. It's the fifth largest economy. It's going to get bigger. You have another big uh, historical uh, econom uh, economic center, uh, Europe. And then you have countries uh, uh, between them, which again traditionally, have played a very important uh, role in uh, ensuring commerce, not only between these two uh, poles, if you would, but also between these countries in the middle and them. So, you know, yesterday evening, uh, we, were, we had a dinner uh, for the Saudi delegation because uh, the Crown Prince was here. And uh, uh, one of uh, the, you know, the, the Saudis actually were telling me, they said, look, we have parts of Saudi Arabia where for generations there are pathways and there are, uh, you know, routes. Everybody knows historically these were the routes which went to and from India. He said these are places where actually people uh, enjoyed a high standard of living. They, they actually had a way of living which was related to the, uh, to the trafficking, uh, you know, to the goods movement, yeah. uh, uh, which is going there. Now, with uh, similarly with uh, UAE, you know how deeply uh, what you know the maritime tradition, the dhows coming, the monsoon trade, etc. So we have now a certain favorable geopolitical situation where Saudi Arabia would like to. Uh, step forward and facilitate a certain seamless uh, logistical movement. You have UAE wishing to do the same. You have an India which is focused very much on Europe, a Europe which is very much focused on India. So what, you will, what would you do if you are a smart strategist? You would put it all together. And so I would say in a way it's very much an evolution uh, on the one hand uh, a greater awareness in India and Europe about the merits of dealing with each other economically, but also greater awareness on both India and Europe's part of the importance of the region, uh, especially the, uh, the Gulf uh, and the Arabian Peninsula here, uh, and of the countries themselves. So uh, this, is, this is a big deal because it, you know, the, uh, the question of how to create seamless uh, uh, economic flows, logistical flows, is one of the big issues in, in world history. So, so, so the return to history, you would say. It, it's, a, and, it's going back And that history. return to history predates any, any belt or any road which any country may have had. Okay. No, one of the concerns about this belt and road that we were both referring to has been about the uh, debt sustainability. We've seen countries, smaller countries, uh, that are not able to afford uh, and, and going financially broke, even closer home countries like Sri Lanka. This corridor, how may it be more sustainable? How is it envisaged to be more sustainable? Well, just look at the look at the players here. 
Okay, you are talking India, Saudi, UAE, Europe, and America, and you are even thinking that sustainability. Okay. Okay. I mean, these are countries with uh, deep pockets. These are countries with a strong market. You know, they have the ability to evaluate projects and to say yes, this will work and that that will that will not work. So I I look again. I I you know I'm I'm not making a a political point when I say don't compare. I genuinely believe sure. that this one is is different. This is a set of today contemporary leaderships very aware of the opportunities before them, taking what has been a time-tested historical concept and then trying to see if we can give it a modern incarnation. And that is why I think it's very important. You, you did mention about the Green Climate Fund. It was announced many years ago in Paris. Um, it was a $100 billion fund. Not much of that money has gone to developing countries. And now in this uh, Delhi edition of the G20, there's been an announcement of a new Green Climate Action Plan. Uh, where is the, the nub of the problem? Is it that the developed world just doesn't want to cough up the money? Or is it that that mechanism was not working? We're trying something new now? No, uh, I, it's, you know, it's not just uh, climate action. Though, though obviously the uh, I mean, if you look at 2023 yeah. versus, let us say, 2015, 2016, uh, no question in the last uh, six, seven years, climate worries, climate anxieties have grown. True. Okay. Each one of us have experienced in our lives. I mean, you know, our lives are hotter, wetter, colder, yeah. drier, all at the same time, and that's a bad sign. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there's a larger uh, issue, uh, uh, there's a climate action issue, there's also a sustainable development uh, goals issue, which is three years of COVID, one year of the Ukraine conflict, where are the resources today to keep the progress? So there are a large number of countries. This was the, uh, the, the core message coming out, you know, when we did this Voice of Global South exercise. The, the core uh, sort of uh, uh, the distillation of what we gathered was really saying, look, we are on the ropes. I mean, we are cutting our nutrition, we are cutting our health, we are cutting our roads, we are cutting our education. So, uh, I mean, for God's sake, find us some place where uh, today we get some some comfort, some easing up of the of the uh, financial pressure on us, uh, and. Uh, uh, what, therefore, we are hoping is that uh, the G20 summit and what follows thereafter uh, would find ways by which there would be more uh, resources available. More resources available for green, for development and for green development. So, and that resources is both institu the current institutions having more resources uh, the individual countries putting in more resources, but also leveraging that resources to get more resources. So one of the things that's been mentioned in the joint declaration, PM has also been mentioning this time and time again about how India is hoping to be the voice of the global south. In a deeply divided world where you have the West, America and its partners, and you have you know, Russia and China on the other side, and also because of the role that emerging countries like Brazil and Indonesia and uh, other emerging South Africa, etc., played uh, in the in finding the consensus joint statement. Do you believe that countries of the South can be the bridge between these what, what many are calling great power competition? Uh, perhaps, but I think the countries of South have their own concerns, uh, and uh, part of uh, really what we saw last year, and which we did not want to have a repeat of this year was that the uh, deep concerns of the countries of the South would be buried under the uh, pressure of the East-West yeah. uh, friction. Uh, so, uh, yes, I, I would say, uh, I mean, if you ask the bulk of the countries of the South, most of them would say, you know, uh, we, are, uh, we are deeply anxious about this conflict. Uh, we really don't want to see this continue. We would like to find a, a way of ending it uh, because we don't think it's good for the parties involved, but we don't think it's good for any of us. That it is adding to the stresses uh, in the global fractures 
uh, which 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 are already there. Uh, so at this moment, I would I I think it's more realistic to focus on the uh, global South's own concerns. But that having been said, uh, if uh, I I've seen every time there's any discussion uh, about. Uh, you know, what can we do to deal with the Ukraine uh, conflict? Uh, you know, I've seen the Africans sought to take an initiative. Brazil tried to do something. Uh, so uh, countries will, uh, will want to do it because it's also their way of expressing uh, their position. Now, who knows at what point, uh, you know, suddenly it may click. You know. uh, but where we are concerned, you know, for us, uh, I would say the the key issue in this summit was uh, that you take a, a, a full global uh, perspective. Uh, you do not, you know, uh, uh, prioritize one set of problems at the expense of other set the of other. problems. Uh, that you recognize the totality of challenges, and especially we focus on what has been a source of great uh, anxiety for for the global south. And I think. Uh, in that shining that spotlight uh, on the on the predicament of the global south, we have been quite successful. Before the summit began, when uh, the Chinese president decided not to attend the Delhi G20, it was seen as a snub to India. But do you believe, with what has been achieved in the last two days, in the, in, over Saturday and Sunday over the Delhi G20 summit, uh, not just India but other countries in the G20 have shown to China that if China does not want to be part of that room at the highest level, then it's China's loss, it's not the rest of the world's loss. Look, uh, again, uh, it's honestly not for us to say who will go at what level to which meeting. That's a national choice. Mm -hmm. It's a national choice and we must respect uh, that. Uh, uh, in terms of what happened in Delhi, uh, I would say, look, China was an important player. Uh, and uh, finally, at the crucial moment, uh, China was uh, contributive to what was uh, overall uh, consensus. So it was not that therefore they were not part of the conversation. They were very much in the conversations. They were very much in the negotiations. So I mean, the G20 at the end of the day was 20. Every one of them, uh, uh, you know, played their part, their full part uh, in that. So, uh, you know, beyond that, you know, uh, what call any country takes about the level, I think that's for them to to weigh the merits of it. You know, because as a big advocate of multilateralism, going forward, do you see sort of competing multilateralisms? There are institutions like the G20, World Bank, IMF, etc., which one set of countries will be gung-ho about, and there are groupings like the BRICS and the SEO, where China may want to take the lead on. Do you see sort of competing multilateralisms happening? Uh, well, I would, uh, one, say that from our G20 summit, uh, this G20 summit, the New Delhi G20 summit, first of all, it's good for multilateralism. It is. It's good for multilateralism because uh, the sense over the last many years has been, you know, it's impossible to get everybody uh, in the room to agree. Okay. But there's been actually a, a cynicism almost uh, verging on, you know, uh, nobody even tries hard. Uh, as a result, okay, I think we reverse that. You know, uh, one one for me, one very powerful takeaway was people leaving Delhi. The other 19 delegations would leave with that sense that look, guys, uh, we actually got a common landing point. Yes, uh, nobody would have said we got a hundred percent of what we wanted, but that's always the case with with a multilateral uh, outcome. But that we got. A landing point that we were able to uh, agree on on core issues, and we did not allow differences because there are differences. I of mean, course. let's not uh, pretend that there are not. That even though there are very deep differences on some issues, we had the wisdom and the foresight uh, to come together on the issues on which uh, uh, we would agree. Uh, but the other part, which you mentioned about BRICS, you know, I want you to uh, really uh, reflect on what you yourself said. Please don't think that BRICS is something which is led by one member of the BRICS. BRICS has five members. Sure. Let me tell you, each of the five weighs in forcefully, actively, productively on, on what happens in the BRICS. We've just come out uh, of a BRICS summit. 
of it. Uh, you know, there is a sort of a Western narrative uh, which would ascribe to BRICS a certain kind of uh, national ownership. I think it does a disservice to all the rest of us. Uh, so, the, you know, this may be a kind of a polemic uh, between, uh, you know, China and the West, but I don't think it's a true picture and I, I don't think, frankly, it's very helpful to actually understand what is happening in the BRICS either. I do want to talk to you about one issue that cropped up again on the sidelines, one of the bilaterals that happened. Uh, the Prime Minister putting out a very strong statement to Canada on this issue of Khalistan uh, business, the support and the safe haven that Canada or, or sections within Canada seem to have become. But the Canadian Prime Minister in his press conference uh, sort of seemed to characterize this as a freedom of expression slash foreign interference uh, issue. How would you respond to that characterization? No, I look, I don't think there's anything for me to respond to. Uh, you know, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister and his system uh, said what they had to say. I think our system said uh, what it had to say. Uh, uh, the, the particular issue, uh, which is the space which has been given to the Khalistanis in, in Canada, I think is a worrisome issue. I think uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this is one occasion, it's not a new conversation. True. Uh, this is part of an ongoing conversation. So I, I think that's really uh, what there is to it. I would, I would uh, leave it at that. Have you lent one of your aircrafts to him? Uh, I believe he had some trouble. Uh, no, I, I think finally his, uh, his aircraft uh, got repaired. And, okay. You know. All right. So finally, Dr. Jashankar, I mean, I said this at the, at the top. I mean, you, you and your team have been working round the clock for the last year since we got the presidency and you finally made it happen. This is a huge success. Uh, do you feel like Sachin Tendulkar after scoring 100 hundreds? I mean, what next for you personally? No, look, uh, I would say uh, when we look, uh, you know, when we uh, reflect on this G20 summit, no question, it's a very important diplomatic achievement. Uh, I'm sure someday, uh, maybe five years, ten years, somebody writing on Indian foreign policy and says, okay, this was the rise of India, they would certainly say, okay, this was an uh, important milestone. Uh, it was an important milestone for a variety of reasons. One, it showed an Indian ability really uh, to, to forge a consensus. Now, why did that happen? I'm sure, you know, everybody worked yeah. hard, that's one part of it. But it happened because for each of those 19 countries, the relationship with India was also important. So one was the merits of the issue, but uh, no question for them, uh, the fact that the presidency was in India, that India was the host, uh, was also very much a factor. Uh, you, you, could, you could see that. Uh, it was an opportunity for us also in many ways to, uh, you know, uh, demonstrate uh, both our, you know, I would say contemporary uh, face, you know, the technology face. You know, one of the interesting things uh, I must tell you is a lot of people went, uh, we had this place for cashless payments. Yeah, correct. Uh, and that was a big hit yeah. because, uh, you know, many people really, uh, I mean, this is interesting. Much of the G20 had never done anything like this in their own uh, country. Uh, or, you know, a lot of the uh, of the uh, lounge uh, conversation was really about uh, uh, Chandrayaan and the, uh, you know, the fact that you, we chose to do a really challenging uh, location for, uh, for the landing, etc. So they certainly left with a strong sense of, of the change in India over the last decade. But they also left with a sense that, look, here is a country proud of its civilization, you know, very, very... Uh, confident of its culture, today putting uh, that forward. So, uh, uh, the, uh, for me this G20 summit uh, will be a milestone uh, in the rise of India, that uh, people will look back uh, and say, look, these were steps by which uh, India's influence, India's stature, India's image in the world uh, really uh, expanded. And I, I think uh, 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 that is the way it should be and, and here I must say, I mean, it, uh, I mean we, it's not an empty phrase, we always said it was a national endeavor yeah. uh, and uh, I, I would say that in, in every way, whether it was in its coverage, whether it was in its participation, uh, which was in the showcasing, 
in every way it was a national enterprise. All right. Many congratulations once again and thank you very much for speaking with us here on CNN News. Thank you. Thank you, sir.